That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Firestarter, the uh, remake of uh, Stephen King's uh, famous story about a telekinetic girl that starts fires. Uh, it is being released uh, May 13th, 2022, courtesy of Universal, where uh, it will also be streaming on Peacock. The It's the sophomore film directed by Keith Thomas. Did you just put your hand in my face? <laughs> oh, I don't know how close did I get. Um... The original film with Drew Barrymore is what year? 1984, um, which was directed by Mark L. Lester, who is probably better known for Commando. Uh, David Keith was the uh, father. Drew Barrymore, of course, was... Not the, to be mistaken for Keith David. Uh, Greenleaf. Pastor Greenleaf. <laughs> uh, and also of uh, several John Carpenter movies that are uh, great, like They Live in the Thing. Anyway, uh, do you remember who played the mother in the original? Sissy Spacek. I'm just throwing names out. I don't Morgan know. Fairchild. Morgan Fairchild played the mom? Yeah. Oh. And we rewatched this when Shout Factory put out the Blu-ray a couple years ago. Uh, but th that first one had a great cast. Art Carney and Louise Fletcher as the old couple at the farm. Uh, Freddie Jones as the doctor. Uh, George C. Scott as the uh, indigenous character, Rainbird, which was not, you know, good casting. Well, I remember watching it a few years ago. And I didn't like that one. I damn sure didn't like this one. Um, I had high... I don't know why I was excited. Maybe I thought, oh... Because I saw a poster for it when you mentioned it was being remade. And it said, uh, coming to cinema soon. So I thought this would be like a bigger budget thing. Um, and then it had Zac Efron in it. So, you know, I was like, yes, want to see it. Uh, and then right before you started streaming it, I saw that it would be on Peacock. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so we reviewed Keith Thomas's first film, I think sometime last year, The Vigil, where that man... Oh, The Jewish Gentleman? Yeah. Yes, I remember At that. The, okay. Wait, this director did that film? Yes. I thought that film was pretty good. Yeah, for a, a, like a lo-fi horror film. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I was excited learning that. Uh, I think part of the problem might be with the screenwriter, Scott Teams, uh, who wrote and directed The Quarry, which he also reviewed with Michael Shannon and Shea Wiggum, and uh, also wrote Halloween Kills. Uh, maybe he just doesn't... Maybe he's just not anyway, my vibe. But... Anyway, for people who haven't read the book or seen the 1980s film, the story is about a girl who has telekinetic powers, but more uh, notably, she can manipulate fire. And she's the product of two parents who were experimented on by some government agency, I presume, um, that is trying to harness these powers. And I it's really not explained where, like, if they found someone who had them naturally and are manipulating people. But either way, Zac Efron and the lady playing his wife. Sydney Lemon, playing Andy and Vicky McGee. Their names are Andy and Vicky McGee. <laughs> they were experimented on to give them these telekinetic powers which he refers to as pushing mm -hmm. and then they had a baby this little girl charlie and she sort of naturally possessed these powers so they've gone into hiding because they don't want the little girl to be stuck in a lab somewhere being tested on for the rest of her life so they don't have you know she's in school she doesn't have access to any technology because they don't want anything that could potentially trace them so she's an outcast, which leads to their undoing because some students are making fun of her. She gets upset and basically blows up the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So now they have to leave. The agency who's looking for them, they have enlisted the help of the um, indigenous gentleman from the first... Rainbird. His... He's like a bounty hunter. Oh, his name is Rainbird in this movie? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. This but, person also has powers. Uh, yes, was also a fellow experimentee mm -hmm. uh, alongside the McGee's, which uh, plays over in a flashback set in 2008. Uh, and that's played by Michael Gray Eyes, uh, who was recently in a film called Wild Indian opposite Jesse Eisenberg. So he shows up at their house. He ends up killing the mom and then Zac Efron and the little girl run off. Mm-hmm. But he ends up catching up with them again. He's not able to catch the girl, but he sort of debil uh, what what's the word? Dis incapacitates. Incapacitates Zach Efron. Then this government agency come, they take him, 
and lock him up in the experimental research center. So half of the film is the, not half, like the final third is a little girl trying to find her dad. She does. And when she gets there, the dad does his little bullshit on her and basically says, you have to burn this bitch down to stop them. And she does. But, so in the process, she kills her dad and the lady who was like in charge of the center. The captain, played by Gloria Rubin. But. Taking over from Martin Sheen. The little girl does get hemmed up, but plot twist, the rain bird saves her because she spared his life previously. So the final scene is him carrying her limp body, like taking a nice stroll on the beach, the end. Oh, I was so bored by this movie. It feels so bootleg. Um, <laughs> I, so I knew we were in trouble with the opening scene where it's like Zac Efron in the house with the baby. And every scene, he just looks like a proud papa staring at the little, whatever you put a baby in. The, the bassinet. The bassinet. And then the baby like lights the room on fire. So he runs in and grabs her. And then we see the baby ignite in flames. And it's clearly like a baby doll. I knew this was going to be some bullshit. It's worse than the baby in American Sniper. Uh, yes, I, I, I also think the point of remaking something and, and um, you know, contemporizing it, it's, it's set in modern times, not the 80s, like the original. Is like, let's weave some subtext Do about something what's different. going on in the world right or now. That, yeah. Or that, Or, you know, Zac Efron has some line about how she's just got to stuff it down inside and control it. And, and you had made some comment about, you know, a queer allegory. And it's like, well, yeah, why could... Which... To be fair, Joaquin Trier kind of did something like that recently with Thelma, is this uh, girl that uh, her sexual desire, her same-sex sexual desire awakens kind of these telekinetic tendencies. So maybe that's already even kind of been done, but something, something different. Uh, of course, they got to get one little shot of Zach's shirtless. It's fleeting. I know, this... and with all this talk about making pancakes, which we know he's not eating, but... <sighs> so... We meet, so when we meet the little girl, she's at the kitchen table with her dad. And she tells her dad, something feels weird about my body. And immediately he goes, we should talk to your mom about this. She goes, not that. <laughs> so stupid. She's a little precocious. Because do you, if you remember Drew Barrymore's performance, which I don't think is very good, uh, in the original Firestarter, she's doing all that huffing and puffing each time. Uh, and there's these huge fireballs that come shooting. <laughs> uh, so this girl seems almost a little too world weary. Uh, and she's played by Ryan Kira Armstrong this time around. Well, you know, I, I try not to talk about children. I didn't care for her acting. Again, I think she's an improvement on Drew Barrymore's performance. But I, but I also think that how she was directed and written, she, she just doesn't feel like a child, especially one that's protected uh, in such a way and doesn't feel like an an outcast either no be, yeah that's be, because she seems pretty confident and she's there, i mean physically there's nothing wrong with her so i don't know why these the bullies at school are unrelenting like it's uncomfortable and then <laughs> the the scene right before she blows up the bathroom the kids are just bullying her so hard right in front of the teacher and the teacher doesn't do anything and then when she runs off the teacher follows her but i thought like <laughs> It's too much. Well, and then there's the scene with three boys that accost her on bicycles. And of course, they're just immediately, immediately nasty in yeah. this cul-de-sac. Like, we get footage of Zach and his wife, like, when they were in the, like, the research center. So it's meant to be, like, years before. I, I th I'm pretty sure it's in 2008. 2008, okay. They look like, <laughs> the two of them look like Kevin Zegers mm -hmm. and Zoe Saldana. God, you made her, she's a white lady. What? That lady's a white lady? Sydney Lemon, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I thought she was... I thought she was black. I don't... <laughs> well, it's like grainy footage. Well, so then... Well, that's a good point to my next note. The movie is so dark. It is very dark. I thought there was something wrong with our TV because you were screen sharing it from your MacBook. So I'm like, maybe you need... Like, maybe something was wrong. The movie's so dark. No, and I was surprised because <laughs> I like the cinematographer. It's Kareem Hussein who... Uh, uh, was the cinematographer on Brandon Cronenberg's Possessor, which I really liked the look and vibe of that film. Uh, he also shot, um, what's that film with, uh, oh, I'm forgetting, Jay Baruchel, uh, Random Acts of Violence. 
You know, I don't he, know. He also shot that film, which I think the best part of that film was how it looked. And this film feels a lot more contained. However, it does have uh, a really great new original John Carpenter score, which uh, he also he co-wrote with two others, including Cody Carpenter. But the 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 music is good. I would agree. So it's made clear that Zach and the wife have money issues. I'm assuming because they can't take work because they'd be traced. So he is a life coach. So he like hypnotizes people because he has that ability. But it's made clear that each time he pushes, it's affecting him like in a very negative physical way. He's like hemorrhaging. Like he, yeah, he's. So we see him at, like counseling some woman and telling her like it's a hundred dollars a session to help you stop smoking. And then he put he does his little thing on her, and convinces her to stop smoking. And she's like, "Wow, I only have seventy five dollars in cash. Here you go." And my first, I had three thoughts. Number one, why blow your load on the first reading? Because now she doesn't want to smoke. She's not coming back. Two, all this trouble for like $75. Like he was bleeding out of his eyes for $75. And three, why wouldn't he hypnotize people to give him a bunch of money? And I know he's like a good guy, but find like rich assholes and be like, you're going to write me a check for $50,000. Like, like Nightmare Alley kind of. Something. Again. <laughs> The screenwriting. And also, I think, you know, by the time Stephen King did Firestarter, he was already really recycling a lot of his ideas because, you know, Carrie uh, came before this. And I think that if you treat King's text as a, a template, there's there's so many directions you could take this. And it just, it, it, it takes the most obvious choices all the time and it leaves everything about this film feeling really lifeless. The parents get called to the school after the explosion and... First of all, that principal, her dialogue and acting was like, what are we watching? Then they call it like an explosion. And the mom is like, please don't call it an explosion. It makes her sound like a terrorist. Uh, that bitch blew up the bathroom. Like, <laughs> What else are you going to call it? And then the teacher says, like, well, what else would you call it? I thought that was shitty writing. Um, at a point, the little girl gets mad at her mom when she finds out the truth about their life. And she just flips the screw like so quickly. She's like, "I hate you!" And then she sets her mom's arms on fire. Yeah, so they didn't really train her that. I thought that was funny. Well. So then, after she sets her mom's arms on fire, then she's scared and she calls nine one one. But then the dad convinces her, "Do not hang up that phone because they're going to come and take no, us I away." I already know what you're going to say next. Child, the police officer, because you know when you hang up on nine one one, they're either going to call back or someone's going to show up at the house. So. A police officer shows up at the house, and it's this black lady. And when I, whoever did her makeup had her looking so dusty. I, <laughs> Again, it's part of, partly makeup and partly lighting. Um, oh, so bad. I know. Uh, um, but, but what did you think of Michael Gray Eyes as uh, Rainbird? I thought I think he's a really imposing figure on screen. Oh, sure. I thought he was very well cast. Yeah, yeah. Um, the special effects are crunchy. Yes. That's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Then there's a scene where the little girl like ignites a cat like on fire. Because it scratches her. Which I'm already traumatized. Speaking of the man who wrote Thelma or directed Thelma, did we just reviewed that person's film, The Innocence? Eskel votes The Innocence. He's the screenwriter for Walking oh. Fire. The, uh, in that movie, they like badly injure a cat like senselessly. Well, well that's very... Um... That was hard to watch. But in this one, it's funny because the effects aren't that great. So we see this like figure like ignite and then when the flame goes down the cat is still alive but that damn orange tabby is almost as big as that cat was huge girl. that cat was huge okay i think the best scene in the film was so zach and little girl have to hitchhike to get to wherever the hell they're trying to go mm -hmm. and this black man picks them up mm -hmm. and takes them back to the house and they spend quite a bit of time with this man but it culminates with him seeing on the news that it's been reported that Zach has killed his wife and kidnapped the daughter. So the black man calls the police. But then they convince him that he that they're not bad people, but it's too late. The police are there. And then old Riverfoot uh, shows up and he... Rainbird. I'm so sorry. Rainbird shows Riverfoot. up. Riverfoot. I don't know. <laughs> he shows up. So all the cops are outside and the black man is out there trying to convince them that he has Alzheimer's and he made a mistake. And then the the bounty hunter man shoots all the cops. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a very good scene. Yes. Again, though, 
very similar. All of the movements are very similar to the original, except for uh, the wife at the farmhouse, played by Louise Fletcher in the original, is incapacitated in this one, because I, I don't remember that part of it. But uh, Captain Hollister. Gloria Rubin. Poor thing. That Jesus. That dialogue's not Oh my, good. it's so bad. And then she's doing this like breathy whisper. I don't just whispering and shit like I don't understand what why is she acting like that I felt like she was trying to appeal to a child it would have been the directorial she notes. sounded like she was trying to be seductive <laughs> yeah. it was really odd but, but again it, again it goes to, to the bones of this with the script my final note is there's a line where the little girl is in the research center blowing that bitch up and she tells someone liar liar pants on fire mm-hmm I'm done. A woman who's trying to fool her. <laughs> yeah, because you're like, was that in the book? I haven't read the book since 1994, <laughs> so I don't uh, innately remember that. And also, uh, where is, isn't there a song by the Prodigy called Firestarter? Yeah. Where was that playing? They don't have credits? the budget for that. <laughs> well, see, I think they I think they got a deal getting Carpenter uh, to score the whole film, and then they didn't have to have any soundtracks. I wonder why Zach did, I, I, I would love to hear, he probably is not doing press for this, but. I think um, there's a, there's an automatic cachet with both Stephen King and this is a, a remake of, you know, this, there's a fan base for this. It's just, and nowadays this feels like, kind of like the Carrie remake by Kimberly Pierce, it feels like an origin story for superheroes or, you know, it feels very X-Men. Oh, it's so poorly done. Um, what would you give it? I would give it, and this is... I think this is a high, higher score than it deserves, but that Carpenter score, you know, two out of five. I would give it one out of five. It was really dry. It's it was hard dry. to sit through. But I've seen, I've seen a lot. I like Zac Efron and it wasn't enough. I've seen a lot worse than this though. Sure. But, but I almost feel like it deserves a low score because it's like, why take a sort of classic shitty movie and then redo it in a shitty way and then kind of make it like shot for shot. You know, like it's they not don't shot add, for shot. But no, it's not, but they don't add anything to it. Like, uh, they squandered an opportunity. However, it's also a rationale for new original stories from, uh, you know, writers that have something to say. All done? Yeah. Listen to our podcast. Bye.